Hey, y'all. You've stumbled upon the Fishing Business Podcast, and I'm your host, Angie Thompson. Today's guest is one of the smartest and most creative people I know in the fishing industry. Now, I've known Chris Russell for a lot of years, and I've watched him take unique and dynamic approaches to many different projects. Currently, Chris is marketing manager at Plano Synergy, which is a company with several brands you'd recognize, including Plano and Fraybill. Plano, of course, is the iconic tackle box maker, and Fraybill is a fishing accessories brand that makes bait management equipment, nets, and ice fishing gear. Chris has also worked for such powerhouse brands as Shimano and Eagle Claw, so he's got marketing chops, deep experience, and like I said, a creative mind. The reason I'm so excited to have Chris on this week is because the first couple of times I ever had conversations with him, when he would start riffing on something he was working on or something he wanted to do, he'd get my attention real quick because he always seemed to be thinking differently than everybody else, always taking a different tactic. Now, that's something that will get my attention every time. And you know what? Different usually gets everybody's attention. Look, the annual fishing trade show ICAST usually has around 600 exhibitors. That's 600 companies that make fishing products, all trying to get a consumer's attention. That's a lot of fish pictures, y'all. Any marketer that can cut through the clutter of 600 brands shouting for your attention is someone we should listen to. And we're lucky enough to get to sit down with Chris today and talk with him about how he does it. So, you and I may not be a brand on the level with Plano yet, but we can study what Chris does and how he does it to figure out how to grow and get better. So here we go, y'all. This should be good. Chris Russell, I am so glad to see you. You know, I know I've told you this probably over and over and over again, but you're one of my very favorite, you're on the tippy top of my favorite person list in the fishing industry, actually anywhere. So I'm glad you're here. Well, thank you very much, Angie. You're you're high on my list as well. And uh, I, I'm just glad we got the opportunity to get together. It's great. Me too. Me yeah. too. So to jump right in, you know, I've told so many people that I think you're one of the smartest marketers in the in the business, but you have a kind of an interesting background. Um, I'm always so uh, interested and intrigued when people come from the West Coast and end up living on the East Coast. What was that path like? To explain, how did that happen? You know, I, I, you're right. I, I most certainly uh, did not think marketing was going to be my career path looking back to even high school days. Um, what did you think it was going to be? No, I, I didn't. Uh, I love to fish. I grew up fishing. I grew up in a fishing family. Uh, the Pacific Northwest is where I, I kind of called home all through my high school days. And and uh, my family and I used to love to go out. Uh, Thanksgiving Day was kind of a special day. That meant steelhead fishing in the morning and turkey in the <laughs> afternoon. Oh, wow. Uh, that was kind of one of our traditions. But my dad loved to fish. He We had a small boat as far back as I can remember. So the passion of being around fishing and the outdoors, uh, you know, we would we would deer hunt, we would hike, we would camp. We just always were outside. So um, there was a lot of that uh, that I just kind of grew up with. But Angie, uh, originally I was an auto diesel mechanic. That's where I started, honestly. I cannot so, believe that. I, I, I went to school right out of high school, went to a, uh, a tech school and uh, got a certified auto diesel mechanic uh, degree, associate degree. And uh, about halfway through, I realized I did not want to be dirty up to my elbows every day for the rest of my life kind of thing. Yeah. It's a fun hobby, but I didn't want to do it for a living. At, at, at that. I'm blown away because you're so creative. I can't imagine you doing anything other than being in a creative field. Well, you know, we kind of, my, uh, a couple of buddies of mine, uh, you know, we had hot rods in high school, we worked uh, on cars. And so the creative juices kind of went that direction. Uh, I owned uh, 66, 65 Mustangs. I owned a Chevelle, uh, just had different hot rods that, that that's where it all really started. But um, it, in, it, during that path, I was actually living uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, going to school there. And uh, found out that that I needed to return home to my parents' house in uh, Eugene, Oregon, just outside mm-hmm. of Eugene. Uh, we had an illness in the family, and I was the youngest, and I just needed to go back. Uh, went, moved back into my parents' house, kind of unexpectedly, very short notice, and walked into a retailer that is is in the Northwest called Bymart. It's a chain of stores, and they carry kind of everything from fishing tackle to pharmacy supplies. 
and uh, asked for a job and they had an opening for an automotive clerk. And oh my gosh. They literally hired me like on the spot, like no interview. The guy said, can you start like day after tomorrow? And I said, well, maybe three days from now. But, yeah. <laughs> um, and there I just kind of found a good home. I moved up to assistant manager and then store manager. I actually uh, was a store manager of the first Buy Mart that faced a Walmart. In the oh North my Coast. gosh. Wow. So there was none in Oregon at the time. And the store that I was a store manager of uh, actually became the, 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 head buddy point of Walmart and Buy Mart out there. How fun. Um, and then I moved into the buying office and bought fishing tackle, automotive supplies, a variety of other categories. Now, how long was that before you got hired until you moved into sort of that um, role? You know, it was about three years uh, before I became store manager, about a year there. And then I moved in the buying office and did that for about seven years. Gosh. Yep. All right. And then what? Uh, so the buying position, I was buying all fishing tackle for about 50 stores. And that led me to know a lot of people in the fishing industry. You know, right. I, I, I got to meet guys like Bill Dance on a fishing trip. Um, you know, some other iconic figures in the industry. Uh, Forrest Wood was someone I crossed paths with at ICAST back in the day. You know, some of these just real, real great figures that I always remember. Uh, but the short version is I did a lot of business with Eagle Claw fishing tackle. And at the time, I was doing a lot of packaging design work. I was working on some private label products for the company I worked for. And we were kind of, I was going back to school and learning more marketing. Told a few white lies and they believed enough to hire me the first time. And then that catapulted me into the true marketing director job at Eagle Claw uh, back in 2001. Oh my gosh. And that, that's actually, I met you when you were at Eagle Claw. Um, it doesn't surprise me to hear you say that you did all those different things because I, you know, I think when you're smart, you can do a lot of different things and you're, you're clearly and obviously very smart. But um, do you consider yourself more of a creative? Is your, ta do your talents lie with being creative or do your talents lie with being a good business person? Um, you know, it, it, it's funny. That's like, sounds like a job interview question, right? Oh <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean um, to. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's interesting. You just came across like, wow, I haven't had a job interview. In <laughs> um, you know, I, I consider myself a, a strong creative thinker. Um, I enjoy that side of it. I like having a little bit of that quiet time where you can just analyze problems and look for solutions. Um, I think one of my strength though, honestly, is being able to just, uh, be a team builder and surround myself with smart people. You know, yeah. no one marketer can figure it all out. There's so many angles and so much diversity uh, in the people we're trying to speak to, uh, you know, from East Coast to West Coast or fisheries or, you know, whatever it might be. And so I, I always have kind of said, I'm the strength of, of my success has been around the smart people that I've been able to associate with, learn from, you know, yeah. challenge me. Uh, people that I've hired were, were way smarter than me at times. Right. And, and, uh, and, and made, that, that probably is it. You've, it sounds like you've made some really good career choices too. After Eagle Claw, you went to Shimano, right? Correct. Yep. Did I had the opportunity there. to, uh, to move and, and move to Southern California uh, with Shimano, worked in their corporate offices there, uh, Orange County, California. And then uh, during that stint, they uh, decided they were going to split their offices and have an East Coast and West Coast facilities and asked if I'd be interested in Charleston, South Carolina. And Southern California just wasn't a great fit for my wife and I. Uh, you know, we, we love the area, but just wasn't quite our cup of tea, a little too uh, urban. Uh, mm -hmm. We were living in a condo and cost of living was expensive. So uh, we said, heck yeah, we'll go. I, I didn't even know Charleston was North Carolina or South Carolina hardly yeah. at the time. You know? And do you like it? We do, yeah, we, we it love it here It seems like you do. We, we found a great home. We've got a lot of good friends. We're close to the ocean. I've transitioned to where I, I fish in the salt water about 80% of the time now for redfish and sea trout. Uh, we were out fishing for flounder late yesterday evening. And so yeah. um, I love the, the salt water area. And, uh, you know, two things I feel like I've been really lucky with in my, in my path, Angie. One, um, I've got to work for three of the best companies in their category. Absolutely. You know, with Eagle Claw, then Shimano, then Plano, all kind of pillars within mm -hmm. their category strengths. Um, and the other side of it, I've got to live in some of the best places in our country. You know, oh, that's true. Too. Would, a lot of people would die to live in Denver, or they'd love to live in in the Northwest, Southern California is a mecca for a lot of people, and now Charleston. And so I, I've been I've been very lucky in in several parts it's of my just, career. You have a charmed life. 
I'm telling I guess you, and it's it, well you know, deserved. So, what? Talk, talk a little bit about what you do now, and sort of, you know, what that really means. Because we we hear these titles sometimes, but I'm interested to know kind of what your day looks like. Okay. Okay. Um, well, you know, as as many of us, my day doesn't look the same as it did maybe t- uh, five months ago. Right. Uh, but you're although, so you're at Plano now. I am. Yep. I, I am the marketing director for Plano Molding, and. Uh, uh, when I came on board, it was all fishing. I, I was marketing for the Plano brand and the Frayville brand. Another so, iconic brand. Yep, Plano. Another one. Yep. Yeah. Been around since the 30s. Frayville is actually the older of all the brands. Um, uh, and then recently I've evolved and now I'm doing uh, marketing for Plano molding in its entirety. So oh. that means hunting, uh, storage, and fishing are the three big categories. Uh, we also have a, a, some household brands that we're working on, in addition to Plano Fishing and Frayville Fishing. So awesome! Uh, and so, what is your title? Uh, marketing director. And so, what does that, like I said, what does that mean? Sure. Uh, it it really it means that that if it's marketing for those brands, it kind of flows through me. Uh, our our team is is actually very uh, compact. There's not a lot of us. Uh, we do work with several outside agencies. So mm-hmm. my management of people is really at the agency level, the ad agency, not direct uh, support. I have one very talented uh, in-house creative uh, designer that I work with and we work on the brands together, but uh, I work with four different agencies at different times, wow. uh, negotiate anything from print TV, radio to sponsorship and pro staff, uh, work on the creative direction you know, I, I was involved deeply in the Edge launch, so mm-hmm. I work with our product team and engineering team on on coming up with captivative ideas around new product launches, colorways, uh, ways to explain technologies, and uh, just just if it's marketing, it's me at it, it, my brand here. And so, do you? You said you had four agencies, but do you manage like your pro staff? Does that all go through you, or and the people that you deal? You know, like TV show. I know you do some mm-hmm. TV shows and things like that. Is that all? funnel through you or does an agency do that for you? No, currently it is. It is all through me. I, uh, I took on pro staff. I, I really love the pro staff side of things. Right. Uh, and, and one of the reasons I enjoy doing it and I feel like it's important, a lot of marketing managers kind of push that off or they, they outsource that. But, but that is how you know what's going on in the pulse of our industry. You know, those guys are in the field. They're fishing 340 days a year sometimes um, all over the country, you know, I've got pros in Canada. I've got pros in Key West. I've got pros that ice fish. I got pros that that uh, 100% saltwater walleye to to the salmon guys to long range tuna guys. So I, I get to hear what's really happening, and and you get to see trends a lot of times before before the average person might even catch on to it. Oh, that's cool. So real quickly though, what what is the synergy of Plano Synergy? So the company is Plano Synergy. Just for people out there that don't realize, it's his brand. The, there's a Plano brand, but the company is called Plano Synergy. And what is the synergy? Correct. Yeah, the synergy um, that that was the result of a of a merger several years ago. Uh, there was a number of hunt brands that were under a, ah, a synergy type corporation, I and see. then Plano owned Frayville, and okay. they they put those two together. Uh, so there, you know, there's a dozen brands within our portfolio. Two of them are designated really as fishing brands. The rest are in the hunt side. So gotcha. we own anything from Barnett crossbows to wild game, game cameras, uh, you know, Ameristep lines. You know, there's a lot of crossover in technology. So, you know, some of the things that, that we learn or that we get out of the Plano brand, we can apply that to a, to a, a hunting category or uh, what yeah. we do on a Frey Life shelter might help uh, Ameristep uh, hunting blind. And that um, that 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 uh, crossover is synergy. That's the synergy. Yes. <laughs> ah, I think I'm so funny. All right. <laughs> you are. You are. You are. We're, we're gonna break for here for just a second, and we'll come back with Chris Russell from Plano Synergy. We'll be right back. I really want to hear from you to know what kind of questions you have and how I can serve you best in this podcast. The easiest place to reach me is probably at Facebook or Instagram, where you can find me as Fishing Business Podcast or on YouTube. But you'll have to search for me there by typing in Fishing Business Podcast. Holla! 
Okay, we're back on the Fishing Business Podcast with Chris Russell from Plano Synergy, one of my favorite marketers in the industry. And Chris, I have to tell you, I've seen you do some really creative things. And I'm not saying, when I say creative, I don't mean like, oh, that uh, ad was great or that tagline was great. I've just seen you think differently than other people. And, you know, um, it seems to me like you are kind of a you know, an acolyte of the Jerry McInnes, uh, uh method of thinking, style of thinking that is, if everybody's doing this, you do that. If everybody zigs, you zag. And it just seems like that's what you've done along the line somewhere. Just even, I remember, uh, I think it was ICAST, you doing the poker tournament. That was, I thought it was such a great yeah. thing to do at ICAST and so different from what everybody else was doing. Um, how do you how does that play into your the way you approach marketing well I, you know one that is a great compliment you know if, if you compare me to somebody as successful as jerry that that uh, I'm, that means a lot i appreciate it um uh, it, it most certainly is what i try to do and and what it's what you know in some cases i've had to find brands that allow me to go down that path um, right you know, one of the things my, my stint at Shimano was fairly short and I had people ask me, it's like, why would you ever leave such an iconic brand as that? And, you know, they're very good at what they do. You know, maybe the best at, at what they do. Premium, top quality rods and reels. Um, but their marketing isn't built to run that way. And so I, well, I had a great time and, and I learned a lot. They challenged me to be smarter and be better. Um, it, in the long run, it, it wasn't a great fit for me because that's not how they want to do things it's really kind of not in their culture. Um, but, but I have most certainly done that. You know, we, uh, we launched Trocar Hooks a number of years ago. And I guess that was one of the ones I kind of hang my hat on as a defining product launch. And, you know, one of the things we did is we built an entire war room around what everyone else was doing in that space. We huh. had every ad we could find. We had every image of a pro staff we could find that was sponsored by Mustad or owner or Gamagatsu. And we said, whatever they're doing, we're not going to do any of that. It has to be completely off their, their pace. Uh, and one of the things that came up as, as no fish in any of the imagery. For ah. two so everyone was holding a fish. That was the standard right. of a fish hook advertisement is we make sharp hooks and here's proof. And they would hold up a big bass or there'd be a big saltwater fish. So we, that's one of the things we said is no fish. And so we just kind of went around and if you take the fish out, then what do you have to do to make the ad exciting instead? And that's, right. that's, that's how we led down the path of what Trocar looked and stood for. And it did. It was launched as a really powerful visual brand with a brand story around it that was instantly communicated in my mind. And what I thought it did really well was cut through the clutter, probably because it didn't show, it, you weren't showing fish. You know, I talk a lot on this podcast into uh, anglers that I coach about um, what, what they're what they're putting out in in social media needs to be more than the grip and grin because mm -hmm. you can't yeah. cut through the clutter right yeah. 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 if you yeah. if you continue to do what everybody else is doing sure but yeah, yeah. Trocar was a great great example of that um, thanks yeah yeah that, and that. and. And speaking of, of brand launching, uh, launches, you know, an angler who's trying to get started as a professional angler is basically launching a new brand. And so you guys ought to really listen to what Chris just said right there, because you could take what he said and apply it to what you're trying to do to, to launch a brand. But um, what, what do you think, how, how would you, how would you um, uh, recommend someone getting started to look at a brand like Plano, how would you recommend them to watch that and, and learn from it? Hmm. How you market? Um, you know, it, 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 it's a challenge for many beginning anglers because they don't have maybe a lot of means. Um, right. You know, they're juggling a full-time career and a tournament trail, uh, traveling a lot. You know, uh, many of these guys are, are fairly young. Maybe they have a family, maybe they don't, you know, it's, so there's a lot. There's a lot on their plate. Um, you know, there was a seminar that I attended not too long ago. It was actually with uh, the fishing industry and uh, a lady named Sally Hogshead. I don't know if you. I do. The, I've read and, her books. And, you know, she had a quote in there that, that said, different is better than better. And yeah. I, I have that in my office now because it, it is so true in so many ways. I don't think anglers can go and say, I'm the best angler 
at right. the FLW level or the whatever level they're fishing. What you mm-hmm. kayak, redfish, bass, I, no matter. I it, it, no one can say they're the best over and over and over again. You know, even Jordan Lee, who's flying high right now, or Kevin Van Dam. You know, there's peaks and valleys, and so what you can work to do is be different. And I think that goes back to your branding statement of how do I stand out? You know, right. what am I delivering that's different uh, than, than other people? And, you know, I, I think it's, it, it has to be past this idea of that I'm entitled to a sponsorship because I don't think any angler is entitled to a sponsorship, even if they're the most loyal user of a brand. That's all they've ever used. That's all they'll ever use. It's the only truck they'll ever drive maybe. You know, because we, we get pretty passionate about our vehicles sometimes, mm-hmm. right? It's like, I'm a Ford guy or I'm a Dodge guy. Yeah. Um, but you don't deserve sponsorship by that company. You're just a brand user. And so you've got to prove your value. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, we're all trying to make a couple bucks. Uh, we do this for fun, but we got to make money. We have budgets we have to adhere to. You know, I have reports that I have to do to show that my money is being spent wisely. And so... Um, I think that's the one thing that, that be a bit different, approach it from your strength, you know, think about what your, what your strength is. And, you know, you, you may be funny and Gerald Swindle has made a living being funny and a pro angler. Right. And, and people love him for that. Um, and so you find your strength and then, you know, use ways, your social media is a great opportunity to kind of tell that, that, that story and then I think sponsorship comes much easier than I just won this recent tournament approach. You're singing my song. We're singing from the same <laughs> hymnal. I love it. So it, to do that, I think guys have to apply a little bit of creativity to what they are, what, how they're portraying themselves and think about it from a creative standpoint. Is create, is create, can you, can, is creativity a skill that you can cultivate? Can you get better at being creative? You know, I, I think uh, in, in today's society of YouTube and, and other accessible learning programs, you can. And, yeah. and you can catch up pretty quick. Um, you know, you don't have to be uh, the best marketer in the world. And maybe that's not your cup of tea and you don't even want to do it, um, which, which is fine. Then that, that means I still keep to keep a job. I don't, you know, I don't mean <laughs> too many smart young people pushing me out too soon. But um uh, what what you can do is is there's videos online. I mean, if you just want to to look at new ways to improve your your following or your engagement or your live feeds on Instagram, there's a hundred videos. I watched two this week, and so right. I still try to learn and and try to gain knowledge of what the newest things are and how to be a little smarter along the way. So um, it doesn't come natural for some people, like it's left brain, right brain, and mm-hmm. it's hard to pull that together. But you most certainly can learn the principles and then right. apply that type of thinking. Um, but it takes sometimes just just some quiet time to concentrate on it. You know? Yeah, I recommend uh, windshield using your windshield time to mm-hmm. instead of you know every tournament ang- angler that I know if they haven't done well in a tournament when they drive home all they're thinking about is what if I had done A, B, and C instead of D, E, and F. Mm -hmm. And I recommend that you let the past be the past. And um, while you're driving, think about other things. (laughs) Use that time to be, to to try to think creatively. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yep. So go ahead. I'm sorry. To do that too. You know, Angie, I mean, you know, podcasts like this are, are, are a perfect way to learn. You know, they're available. Uh, You know, there's plenty of books. There's the YouTube side of it. Um, You know, there, there's really more, easily accessible knowledge now than, than ever. And, um, and I just recommend just being really observant. That's why I asked that question of what could they learn from what you do? Because I think if you can watch somebody else that's really good at what they're doing, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't even have to be in fishing. You know, you can look at somebody else and how they're telling their stories and how they're branding themselves and how they're pushing out the message. And it could be, uh, you know, I don't know, it could be a basketball player and you can learn from them, watch how they're doing it. Right. Sure. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, you know, it, it, there's a few things that, that you just can't replace and it costs absolutely nothing. Uh, enthusiasm is one of them, you know, that, that if you're enthusiastic about your trade, your skill, and, and you let that show through your emotions kind of come to the surface, uh, through a social media, it, people want to hear and see that they don't want to see people moping around and monotone. So, you know, that that's, that's an easy one to me is, is when I look at new pro staff is what's their level of enthusiasm 
Um, and what do they bring to the table as far as, as that? Because right. I don't want to be dragging them along. I, you know, it, it's easier to kind of hold them back a little bit if I need to in a brand than, than drag them along with me. So that, yeah. that's an important skill and that doesn't cost a nickel. So. It doesn't. And everybody can get better at that. I mean, there's some little tricks you can do to, you know, like, like I have sat through and I, as I'm sure you have, I've sat through, you know, hundreds of weigh-ins, hundreds of weigh-ins. And sure. you're always so uh, happy when someone takes the stage that has a lot of energy because it changes mm-hmm. everything. You know, you've seen p- guy after guy after guy after guy come through and just go, yeah, I caught him on a worm. <laughs> you know, and then and then somebody comes up and is like, "Hey, how's it going? We had a great day out there." And you're like, "Woo!" You know, you notice that, and it feels so refreshing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you know, like you said, we watched them, and and that's the kind of stuff that that if you're lucky enough to be on stage with Dave Mercer, he starts feeding off that, right? Right. Then you know, it's it's boom, boom, just gets bigger and bigger, and he keeps you on stage a little longer because he wants to hear the story. And next thing yeah. you know, you got more airtime than the next guy. So. That's right. That's how it works. So, to talk about that a little bit too. When people are up on a stage or in their social media or talking to consumers at a trade show, what would be a good story from a branding st- point of view? What what from a marketer's point of view what's an ideal story that one of your pros would tell uh you know um honesty i I talk to my pros all the time like i never want them pitching an item if it's not legitimately something they believe in or use and you know there's a lot of ways that we define what pro staff should be doing and i need you to you know post x amount of times and take so many photos or do whatever but but I emphasize all the time is I need authenticity in what you're doing. So mm-hmm. you need to be talking about things that you already know and believe in. And I most certainly think the easiest way for any pro staff to tell the brand story is teach. Yeah. You know, the, these, these anglers are so full of little tricks and knowledge and tips. And, you know, it can be anything from how you load your boat after a long tournament day and you're tired, but you still have this five-step process. So I know I do it right. It can be how you store an odd-sized bait. It's your ritual for putting online. It's the the way you deal with with whatever it might be. Um, uh, Rigging, tying a knot, you know, there's a million ways. And and so I think the guys that can weave brand into this storytelling and teaching are the ones that really kind of win the day in the long run. Agreed. I agree 100%. You know what I don't hear enough about, though, Chris, is uh, at the level of don't put your soft plastics in with your crankbaits. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like the real, real basic. And maybe it's because the media I consume is too advanced. But I just don't see a lot of uh, the very, very basic understanding of how to do things. See, now you're singing my kind of song. Good <laughs> this is, uh, it, th- we're... we're in, internally, I call it, you know, there's front of the boat brands mm-hmm. and then there's back of the boat brands. And Plano has a challenge because we're a back of the boat brand, right? At that moment of truth, when you hook that biggest fish, when you're when you're landing the one that's going to push you over the top, you're, you know, five fish limit and it's a five pounder. Um, Plano boxes are gone. They're underneath the deck lid. They're put away. You know, the trolling motors right there front and center. The electronics are in the shot. The rod's in your hand, the lure's in the fish's mouth. Um, so, you know, you're right. It, and, and so we are constantly looking for better ways to tell our story and make it uh, uh, acceptable. And the only way I know how is through that teaching method. Yeah. And uh, we, don't, we don't do it enough. No matter how much I do it, I don't think it's going to be enough. But, but we are embarking on that type of marketing to kind of teach people about the, the solutions we provide. Right. So what do you see new guys, aspiring young guys, or they don't have to be young, but aspiring guys under the right, what do you see them doing right these days? Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that, that a lot of the, the smart young anglers do is it feels like they're, they've, there's, a, there's a little bit different understanding of what's required, and it's not just fishing. You know, it's, it's, it's this piece of, of, I need to have a pretty strong uh, social media feed. Uh, you know, I, I need a YouTube, I need to be comfortable in front of a camera. Right. Um, some of these kids are learning that at a very young age, you know, they're, they're eight, 10, 12, and, <laughs> and they're already better in front of the camera than I am in some cases. But, um, I, I think that, that's what I see uh, many of them doing right. And in some cases, that's why these college anglers kind of leapfrog over some older anglers because right. they're 
they'll talk right to the camera like this and spill their heart and, and just kind of be uh, all the things we talked about, enthusiastic. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what they could do more of is less about themselves and more about the storytelling, I think, is, yeah. is one thing. But, yeah. but I think this idea of, of just being genuine and being willing to reach out to people um, is, a big, is a big step in the right direction. And so the, obviously my next question was, what, what, what could they do better? Is that it? Not uh, do more storytelling and less, uh, and less uh, navel gazing? Yeah, you know the one thing that still sticks with me, and I, I said it earlier. I hate to, I hate to kind of do it twice, but uh, it, it's that entitlement that they deserve a sponsorship. Right. Um, you know, I still get that from anglers every year, like mm-hmm. literally in the in the show floor uh, or on the phone. Um, you know, I get those calls of of you know I've been a I've been a brand user my whole life. My dad used it. I buy your stuff. I bought ten thousand dollars worth of your product last year. Uh, and what, how could I get sponsored? And, and it's really, it's just what, not what the way to, re- it's not the way to lead that conversation. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it, it, it's not because guess what? There's 10,000 more guys just like that. Really? Right. Now, if someone and, calls you whoa. up and says, Mr. Russell, let me tell you what I can do for you. Mm-hmm. You'd, it would be a different conversation, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there was a young man that, that, uh, um, I remember distinctly, uh, at a tournament event. He had won out, um, uh, I think it was a high school tournament that he had qualified for uh, and won. And uh, he came into the booth with his coach. And his coach took the approach of, you should sponsor this man. He just won. He's a big Plano fan. You know, he's going to be something someday. You should sponsor him. And and I I stopped the coach and I talked to the, the young kid and he was, I don't know, 15, maybe 17 at the time. And I said, you know, uh, your, your coach is doing something for you in your best interest. I said, but, but one, you need to lead the conversation because it's yeah. you. Yeah. And two, um, what happens next year if you don't win? Does that mean I get to drop you immediately? And, and I'm not here for a very short term one way relationship. So uh, what he rethought and came back with, he helped me tear down the booth that week. I love you it. Know, he came back and said, you know, Mr. Russell, I appreciate it. And uh, what can I do to work? And, and, you know, he had already switched out of his jersey. He was in shorts and a T-shirt. And uh, he helped me pack boxes. And guess what? That kid's on our pro staff team. You know? uh, I, Chris, you are not going to believe this, but I had almost this exact conversation with a coaching client last fall where he, I asked him what he had done for his sponsors. And he had said, one particular sponsor, and he said, they didn't ask me to do anything. And I was like, oh, no, no. You go down there and help them break down the booth. If right. they need to, if they, you, you don't wait for them to ask you what they need from you, you know, or tell you what they, what they want you to do. Oh, you are. Yeah. We're definitely on the same page. Okay. But slightly <laughs> shifting slightly to a bigger picture. What's the fishing industry doing right, right now? Um, you know, we, we, we've got a bit of a gift, uh, handed to us. Uh, you know, there's a lot of negative swirling around our country for a lot of things that I don't think we need to get into. Yeah, this no, let's don't. Bit. But, but, um, you know, we have got a challenge as an industry and that's to get more people involved in our sport. Um, but all of a sudden we've been handed this new recruitment of people, you know, with, without uh, a lot of vacations going on with no, you know, youth Mm -hmm. organized sports this spring, we we've seen this huge influx of, of fishing anglers, first time anglers or lapsed anglers coming back. Uh, and, and what we need to do is, is look for ways to teach them and recruit them to stay. To stay. You know, we're going to get them once, uh, you know, kind of as a hall pass. But now what are we going to do to keep them? How do we get them to buy a license next year? And mm-hmm. I've seen, you know, some companies really reaching out to try to do that, uh, you know, helping uh, target those folks and give them information. You know, our industry has been spending money on uh, uh, the, these ideas of take me fishing, where there's a, a website reference point where they can go and learn anything from ID of species to tie a knot to where to launch your boat or where to fish on the bank. Um, so I think we're doing a good job with that. Uh, we, we need more of it though. You know, mm-hmm. we, we, it, it never ends. We, we really need to work hard on that. And, and I think, you know, as marketers, we're obligated to play a role there, whether right. we have a small brand or a little one or for a one man operation, or we employ 10,000 people, it's our obligation to, to kind of work on bringing more people into our sport. And we all need to be pulling the same rope in the same direction. Okay. So yeah. what, 
not to, you know, not to be critical, but what is the industry, what could the ind- fishing industry be doing better? What are we not, what are we not doing right? Um, you know, uh, yeah, it, 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 you know, it's tough sometimes with, with some of these things that, that, uh, I don't want to sound critical to right. the work that a lot of people are doing out there mm-hmm. because everyone is, is trying to find their own thing. And, and Angie, I, I think I talked about this a little bit, you know, one of my pet peeves, with this same topic and that's you know this recruitment of bringing people in is i think sometimes we default to free stuff to encourage people to fish and i think it devalues our sport actually well like what do you mean what specifically do you mean um you know there's there's thousands of youth fishing organizations uh or events that are organized every single year Mm-hmm. From the local tournament trail does one to the the Lions Club in the hometown to the Chamber of Commerce does one at the local pond, but it's always I shouldn't say always that's that's too big of a statement. Many times people say if you come and bring your child, we'll give them a rod and reel, we'll feed them lunch, mm-hmm. they get free tackle, we will bus them for free, mm-hmm. and and I think it's all meant in the best scope, but. Um, there is no such thing as that if your child is participating in soccer or that's a good point going to a football camp or baseball or dance or any other sport that I, I mean I'm, I'm a parent my kids went through that hundreds or thousands of dollars were spent on camps and right. teachings and learnings but fishing is just the opposite we almost try to bribe people to come instead of sharing our knowledge because that's where the power is well but, but let me let me let me ask you this though if you go to uh, a couple years ago i went to the um ncaa men's final four basketball tournament mm-hmm. and there were all these there, a, a, you know a, a place there for to entertain kids and that sort of thing they were sure. all giving away things they were giving yeah. away little basketballs they were giving away you know hats they, but so what's the difference there I, I, to me, the, the difference is, and, and I don't say we, we shouldn't give free things away, you know, okay. at an event where you're encouraging your fans to engage and be more excited about the final four event, the Bassmaster weigh-in, that's different. That's different. Okay. Uh, I, yeah. I, I'm talking about where a, a, a young angler would come to learn the skill of fishing. I, I want us to invest in the knowledge that they might leave with and teach them how to do the things. And that's the value, even to the point of where it may need to be uh, a small cost to participate right. in that. There is nothing like that. I don't think, you know, you, youth sports are huge. And, and as you noted, uh, parents will spend a ton of money on youth sports, Yeah, but in fishing, I don't know of any, well, there might be some fishing camps that you can pay to have your kid go to, but they're not very well promoted and not very pe- many people know about them. Do you agree? I do. It's not the norm. It's it's the outside the norm. And there are a mm-hmm. few of those. And, you know, there's some organizations. Um, IGFA is one of my favorites that, that do a youth. It's called Passports to Fishing. Mm-hmm. And it's very organized, very uh, repeatable. They can do it anywhere in the country. They, they ship it in. Uh, the reason I know, because Plano's involved and, and we ship it in our large storage trunks. And when when an organizer gets it, there's a whole systematic approach to teaching inside that. And it walks them through step-by-step step how to do it. Now they don't charge, but they don't give away free either. Right. So, um, so and, and I, and to clarify, you're not complaining about giving kids things. Cause I don't want anyone to give the, get the wrong impression that no, no, no. Chris doesn't want to give a, a kid a pl- tackle box, bless their um, hearts. But what you're saying is it creates a, a thought that, that, that devalues what, what we're trying to do is that right yes Yes, that's what i believe yeah yeah i and and yeah i'm not not trying to be scrooge right and take (laughs) away candy to the kids i I, I think there's a place for for that but it can't be the only thing that we lean on to get people to come to a fishing event um you know people want to learn and they want to be successful they 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 want to be uh, an angler for a lot of reasons. One of them mm-hmm. is spend time with family. You know, the research has shown they want to be outdoors. They want to engage with, you know, adults with their children. They want to have a, uh, a time away from screen time and video games, but, but they also want to catch fish. They want to be successful and they want to be able to repeat that when they get home. You know, mom and dad don't want to look like they're not smart enough to catch a fish when they're on their own. So I, I think 
more emphasis on the teaching, less emphasis on the free is, is, is something I'd like to see us do as an industry. I'm with you on that, brother. I'll help you. Look, I think I'm, I'm sitting here going, that could be a business. We could start summer camps all around the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you know a lot of the uh, the biggest names in the industry. And, and, uh, you know, it wouldn't hurt to have some of those guys show up. So. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, there you go. I'd rather have uh, show up to meet uh, to meet a really good angler that can teach them something than to show up solely to get a free rod and reel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, Angie, I don't want to discredit the work that that people are doing because oh that, yeah, you know, no, no, that's, that's the wrong message. I've that, given away my share of free fishing stuff over the years to kids. Believe as have me. I. I yeah. have too. I'm guilty as charged. And, and we'll continue to do that. Yep. There, yeah. there, I believe there's a better way. Is all I'm saying. I agree. I point uh, point well taken, well yep. made, and well taken. All right, we're going to take another break, and we'll be back. Back uh, with Chris Russell. Can't wait to continue this conversation. Back soon on the Fishing Business Podcast. Hey, if you're enjoying this podcast, check out fishingbusinessschool.com where you can see video uploads of the podcast as well as my blog where I give you more practical advice on the business side of fishing. Fishingbusinessschool.com. Come see me over there. All right, right. we're back on the Fishing Business Podcast, wrapping things up here in just a minute with Chris Russell from Plano. This is my favorite part of the show because I get to ask you fun questions. Uh, Not that the other stuff wasn't fun, but if you could choose a theme song for your the rest of your life, what would the theme song be? Uh, um, You know, I'm I'm a I'm a '80s uh, fan back in the day. uh, You know. the Bon Jovi song, Have a Nice Day, would probably ah. have to be at the top of my hit list. So. I love that. I love that. Okay. I'm an 80s <laughs> music girl, too. So, okay. What's your favorite movie? Movie. Uh, you know, this is a weird one. Um, um, I'll, I'll try not to make it too uh, too odd, but Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Yes, I love that, too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I, I just have loved that movie since I was, I was a, I don't even know when I first saw it, but yeah. I've got my kids hooked on it. My daughter um, oh, does great. some work at a uh, at-risk youth home, and, and, uh, and she's now showing it to kids that are 13 now, and they think it's hilarious and i don't know if they get all the jokes anymore but i I just love that movie talk about um the ultimate enthusiasm whether you're not smart enough to know it or not but that movie's got it that's right okay and your and your favorite your best covid binge watch on on netflix or tv what was your favorite Uh, binge watch no i i i still don't do a lot of tv watching i wouldn't say that i've got a, a binge watch um my wife and i have started have, have got into yellowstone the oh, new yeah. kevin coster series and yeah. uh, that that you could you could uh there, there's a pretty badass thing in that so yeah well you know i was talking to someone about that last night as a matter of fact we were talking about yellowstone it's just so well written that mm-hmm. um i think it's one of the the best written things on tv right now yeah and, and i'm not a huge tv watcher either and i have to really be um, convinced to invest my time in mm-hmm. watching a, a, a TV, but I'll do it for Yellowstone. But I have to tell you, I have not watched this season at all because I'm waiting for it to all be done. And oh, then so I can, can watch, just watch it. All yeah. So then I can, I don't right. have to wait a week to see what happens yep. next to I see if Beth, to see if Beth gets yeah. beat up again. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, right. thank you so much for being with us today. I, like I said, I appreciate the time. I know you've got a lot on your plate and it means a lot to me. Uh, it really does that you would spend, uh, spend some time with me and, and my audience. And uh, I know there's a lot of people out there that, that appreciate it and um, will be listening to this for a long time uh, for years to come. And, um, everything we talked about here is pretty evergreen. So um, you're a wise man and you're very smart and creative and you've got a ton of enthusiasm. And that's one of my favorite things about you. Well, thank you very much, Angie. It's my pleasure. Um, you know, if you uh, ever feel bored enough to invite me back on a new topic, just let me know. Oh, uh, I will. But it, it, it's fun. I, I you know, I, I enjoy engaging with you. We don't cross paths quite as much as we used to. But uh, it's always fun, and I love seeing where you're at with, with, with your life right now and moving on to some new challenges. So uh, just keep doing what you're doing. You're doing the right thing. Thank you, Chris. We'll talk again soon. All right. Appreciate it, Angie. Thanks. I know I'm the biggest nerd ever, but that conversation just made me so happy, y'all. You know, Chris mentioned in the conversation how much he appreciates enthusiasm. Well, he is the most enthusiastic guy. It's always a pleasure to see Chris face to face because his energy is contagious and he just makes you smile. That's the cherry on top of his secret sauce for success. Okay, here's my three takeaways from our conversation with Chris. When everybody zigs, zag. 
there are so many messages out there trying to get pushed through. And as Chris said, different is better than better. Now, that is a Sally Hogshead quote. And I heard her speak at that same event Chris saw her. And I was so taken by what that quote. She also emphasizes that your competitive advantage is not the way in which you're incrementally better than the competition. In order to win business or fans or sponsors or jobs, you have to first get someone's attention. And it's very hard to get anyone's attention when you're so much like the others in your space. All right, number two, teach. A great way to layer in a brand's message again to your story is through teaching. You can teach highly technical things like how you can retune the bill on your shallow diving crankbait, or it can be why you don't want to store soft plastics with those crankbaits. Don't forget the newcomers to the sport. They need to know the basics, and when you teach someone new, you'll probably get a fan for life. Number three, be enthusiastic perfect for Chris. He exemplifies this advice. Didn't you just enjoy listening to him talk? Part of that is because he's smiling and happy and energetic and positive. And all those things are part of enthusiasm. And that's really important. All right. That's going to do it for this week, y'all. Listen, rate, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening or watching today. That's really important to me. It'll help me keep going and help me keep introducing you to people like Chris. Also, you can reach out to me, the Fishing Business Podcast on Instagram or Facebook. I'd love to hear from you. I'm going to sign off now the way the world's greatest fisherman always signed off his show, The Fishing Hole, by saying this is dedicated to dad because he always had time to take me fishing. See you next time, y'all.